I'm looking for some Watsons. Big Russian Watson. Yeah, and I have this photo here. Bill and Victoria Watson. Mm-hmm. We are descendants of them. We mm -hmm. and... And you. And me. Mm-hmm. Go. Dallas Cowboy Emmitt Smith is one of the greatest running backs of all time and holds the NFL record in career rushing yards. EJ. He retired from the game in 2005 and now lives in Dallas with his wife and four children. I grew up in the housing projects and then I moved over. The world of football took me out of one place and I was able to go see something else and see that, wow, I can dream bigger now. This is possible right here in America. So I look at this as a journey back, a journey to reconnect, a way for me and my family truly to understand a lot more of our history. You need to understand where you were to appreciate where you are. The chance to really look into his origins has really sparked something in him because um, he missed so many family gatherings over the years, all the family reunions and all the parties and cookouts. You know, he was playing ball. You know, he'll be 40 this year. So it's a big year for him. It's monumental. As an African-American, most of us have this sense of pride that we have come from the motherland of Africa. And when you go back to the beginning of the Bible, when you go back to Adam and Eve, the beginning is out of Africa. And if so, who am I connected to? How do you connect with it? How does that impact who you are? Those are the answers that I'm looking for. I've been told that tracing African ancestry through written records can be difficult. So I'm taking a DNA test to see what my genes will reveal about my ancestors. Are you anticipating what you're gonna find out? Well, I'm gonna find out probably some key information on my drive, my determination, my passion for certain things. Uh, we all are connected one way or another, and it's by the blood, some way, shape, or form. Now, how that connection ties back to me, that's what I'm looking to find out. So now I have a chance to go back and truly understand how I became Emmett James Smith III. Hi. Hi, babies. Hi. 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 We're going to miss you. Have a safe flight. I hope you find what you're looking for. Love you. Bye, Daddy. There's only one place for me to start my journey, and that's Pensacola, Florida. It's the town where I grew up, and it's the home of my parents. I know very little about my grandparents' background, and I'm hoping that my mom and my father will be able to shed some light on the clouded areas that I have. Grandma, mm -hmm. Emily, and me. <laughs> <laughs> Why didn't we, as a family, talk a lot about granddaddy's background? They had a hard time coming up. There were times they didn't have anything to eat. You, right. you know, they didn't want to talk about what happened back in the older days. With that said, how about my grandmama, Ermalee? Give me a little bit of her background. Well, mama was the oldest of her uh, brothers and sisters. It's Always, cold. if you came up wrong, yeah. you, you, you felt the wrath. <laughs> you felt the wrath. But, but I mean, if you needed anything, she always had it. Never wanted for anything. If I was to start on grandmama's side, mm -hmm. where should I start? There is a website that your cousin Vernon Watson developed. On my grandmother's side, Irma Lee stemmed from Burnt Corn, Alabama. Heard of it, but I don't think I've ever been there. Hmm. This is the beginning. These are old photos. There's Mr. William and Mrs. Victoria Watson. According to the Watson family website, my father's mother, Irma Lee Watson, is the granddaughter of Bill and Victoria Watson, making them my great-great-grandparents. I'm gonna have to go to Burn Corn. Hey, let's go to Burn Corn. I feel like a, like a detective on a hunt, trying to find clues. Wow. It looked like a deserted town. 
I may have dreamt this. You can see over there the U.S. Post Office at Burnt Corn, Alabama. I tell you what, after looking at this, if I'm going to find out any more about the Watsons, I'm going to need some help, because I'm not going to get it from these buildings. These buildings don't talk back to me. I'm going to knock on some doors to find out where are the Watsons. Hello. Hey, how you doing? Good, how you doing? Fine. And I'm looking for some information on some people. I'm looking for some Watsons. You're looking for some Watsons? Yeah, and I have this photo here. Bill and Victoria Watson. Mm-hmm. We are descendants of them. We mm -hmm. and... And you. And me. Mm-hmm. All right, I'm Emmett. Who are you? I'm Joe. You're Joe? <laughs> uh-huh. Joe Watson? Joe Watson, Jr. Wow. It's a pleasure to meet you. Yeah, I thought I'd recognize you. <laughs> <laughs> now, now... I think you admit my father when he was down in Pensacola down in some of them family reunions. And your daddy... is Joe Watson. It's Joe Watson. And your grandfather. Who's your grandfather? was Mob. Mob? Mm-hmm. OK. And you are Joe Jr. As it turns out, <laughs> Bill and Victoria are Joe's great-grandparents, making him my second cousin. I'm looking for some more detailed information that would help me understand them more and even go further. You need to go to the Monroe County Courthouse. The Monroe County Courthouse. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping that the courthouse holds the records that I need to go deeper into my family's past. Emmett Smith is tracing his family roots, trying to find a path back to Africa. So far, his search has taken him to his grandmother's birthplace of Burnt Corn, Alabama, where he has just met another descendant of the Watsons. Now he's heading to the Monroeville County Archives to meet with Dawn Crook. Hello. You must be Dawn. I am. I'm Emmett. Nice to meet you. Pleasure to meet you. Yeah. Um, I was told that you could help me find some information out on the Watson family All right. out of burnt corn. White or black? Black. OK. Since this is black genealogy, that's going to be a little bit more difficult. Why is that a little bit more difficult? Because the records are sporadic. When you do the difference between the genealogy, between the black and the white, mm -hmm. is before the 60s, they were segregated. So you would go to the marriage licenses. They say marriage licenses, see, and they're colored. Color. And the other ones would say white. Hold on a second. Mm -hmm. Now. I've never seen a water fountain that said colored mm -hmm. or white. Right. This is probably one of the first times I've seen a mm -hmm. book that says marriage license colored. Mm -hmm. Wow. When I saw that book that had colored on it, I really felt the power of segregation. I can understand how our people felt isolated and separate from America. And that is painful, very painful. I'm trying to figure out how my family uh, fit in with Bill Watson and Victoria Watson. All right, we'll go to the census records. That's the easiest way. You go to Ancestry.com, and this is something you can do at home, OK? okay. All right. Um, now we're going to go to the 1900 census. OK. All right, try there. OK, there's Bill, Bill Watson. Watson. Right. OK, so he's the head of the house. Mm -hmm. There's Victoria, the wife. OK. William Watson was born in 1862. Right. Victoria was born in 1864. Right. All right. Uh, being born before 1865, does it say anything to you? They were slaves. Mm -hmm. Now that I have the information that I have and understand that Bill Watson was born into slavery, uh, my question now is, how did Bill Watson's family tree began and where. So I'm meeting with Marjorie Shoals. She's a top expert in African-American genealogy, and I'm hoping that she can help me go further back. Well, let me tell you something. I was able to do a little research. I have the marriage license of Bill Watson, uh -huh. Victoria. Per year. Per year is her maiden name. Wow. Now, that's a gem. Because that's an unusual name. And with African-American history, many of them surnames are common, but you want to look for that little nugget 
for a unique name. So what you're telling me is we're, we're about to make a shift. And that shift is coming from the Watson side of the family to the Purrier side of the family to go deeper into exactly. my family's history. Exactly. This name, Purrier, that one may be a slave owner. Really? African Americans at the end of the Civil War sometimes pick the names of their last slave owner. So we want to now look at who were the parents of right. Victoria. The parents of Victoria? Yes. Oh. Take a look at this. Her death certificate, her father's name. Prince Perrier. I just found out that Victoria is the daughter of Prince Perrier. But now I want to know who is Prince's father. And where does the name Perrier come from? Were the Perriers my family's last slave owners? If we don't get any information out of these Perriers, we may be at a dead end. And that's not what I'm looking for is a dead end. Emmett Smith has always been interested in his family's slave history and African ancestry. He's already discovered his great-great-grandparents, Bill and Victoria Watson, were born into slavery, and that Victoria's father was called Prince Perrier. Now he wants to know more about his ancestors, the Perriers. Okay, we want to next go to the 1870 census, the first census where African Americans were listed by name. There's a is that Perrier right there? There's Prince. Right. In 1870, Prince was a 23-year-old. Right. There's an M next to his name. Uh, that could be male. Right. OK, what is the second M for? The second M is a racial designation, M.B. Mulatto. Wow. Mixed race, specifically black-white race. Correct. There's another Perrier. What is this, Mariah? 55. 55. Yeah, she was a housekeeper. Mariah is a mulatto. Are we saying here Mariah is the mother of Could Prince? possibly be. And looking at this whole page, there were the few families that were all listed. As mulatto. As mulatto. So if there's white blood in the family, where did it come from? The slave owner himself? Uh, his overseer. Are we going to look for the white slave owners of the Perriers? If we can find there's a connection to a Perrier who was a slave owner, then that's the road we want to go. This is a story that's getting good. <laughs> 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 I'm loving this. <laughs> okay. Now I know that Prince was mixed race and born into slavery. If Mariah was his mother, could she be the link between the black and the white side of my family? Maybe I have some white blood in me. Now, how much? It may be small, but it's there. And you cannot deny the fact, uh, because I think the information is starting to reveal some of these things. When they had slaves around here, there could have been some co-mingling going on. It's wild, it's challenging, it's heartbreaking. But just finding the information is incredible. What we found here in 1850 census, there were only white per year. So. Right. The records show that there was a white slave-owning family living in the area called Perrier, Mary and Alex B. Perrier. So, are they who I'm looking for, the owners of my family? Marjorie has called me to an old plantation house. She's found some new information about Alexander Perrier. Here in the archives, there was this letter written by Alexander Perrier. I have just received a handsome lot of Negroes, and among them, some 15 to 20 men, if you feel disposed to enter into a traffic. He's selling them. He was a slave. He was a slave trader. Yes, he was. He was a slave trader. We're going to look at his will. I, Alexander B. Perrier of the county. county of Mecklenburg and the state of Virginia. He's getting them from the state of Virginia. He lives here. He lives here in, in Alabama, Burnham. but he came from Virginia. Right. It's a family cemetery. Wow. Mary F. Purrier. The wife of Alex D. Purrier. This is her right here, huh? Take a look at this. OK. One third of the slaves which I have and hold, which I derive from the estate of my late husband, Alex B. Purrier. Mariah and children, Henry, Mary, McTom, 
Victoria and Prince Albert. Wow. Prince Albert. Yeah. This is your family. Now we know that Prince's mother is Mariah. Right. And I've gone back another generation. Exactly. Wow. Miss Mary F. Purrier is passing the entire family over to another family member. They were kept together. That is very important. You know, that's significant that at is that significant. time. Why was this family kept together? Why weren't they sold off and separated out? It's it had, another chapter. Yeah, that is another chapter that we have to explore and see. Right. So let me ask you this. What is the significance of the 2250? That is their value in that inventory. Here, your family were listed with household furnishings. Silver teaspoons and silver tablespoons, a mahogany chair. Mm. They put a price on people like that. And they treated people like, like land and cattle. Mm -hmm. And I can understand now why black Americans fought so hard for freedom and justice. Because to live like that in today's world would not be, I couldn't imagine it. People who came before me were pioneers in terms of shaping the future for me because I am standing on the shoulders of giants. I mean, the little bit that I've gone through is nothing compared to what my family went through. Is Prince or any of the other family members buried here? Wh where are they? Now, this is the White Cemetery. Look beyond the woods here, and the blacks would be buried there. Maybe Prince is over there. It seems like my great, great, great granddaddy is buried somewhere in these woods. Through time, his grave site has rotted over. And I do see Miss Purrier's grave site, and so her family can still come visit her. It is sad that I cannot go visit my great, great, great grandfather. But I'm happy that when he was four years old and she passed, that she wheeled them over as a family together. She did not break them up. So therefore, Prince grew up with his mother and his brothers and sisters, which is a wonderful thing. Emmett Smith is on a search into his family history, trying to find a path deeper into his roots. He's just found out his ancestor Mariah was mixed race. He wants to know if Mariah was a descendant of the white slave owner, Alexander Perrier. So he's headed to Virginia, where the Perriers are from. I'm in Mecklenburg, Virginia, trying to find more information about Alexander B. Perrier, who was the slave owner of Mariah, and what Mr. Perrier did in terms of trafficking my ancestors from Virginia to burnt corn, Alabama. Perrier tires. Wow. Per years, Florence. These Perriers are everywhere. So I must be on the right track. I'm heading to meet a local historian that knows a lot about this area. I am looking for information on Alexander B. Perrier. Alexander B. Perrier was one of the Perrier family that really built Mecklenburg County. Uh, they were one of the first settlers in this county in 1765. They owned a tavern very similar to this tavern. This tavern was the social hub of Mecklenburg County. Slave trading was also one of the business activities at the tavern. So if you look this way, that would have been the audience. The slaves would have been introduced here, and they would have been auctioned by the audience out here. Wow. Men and women. And children. And children. And children. America the Beautiful, <laughs> something else. The more I hear about slavery, the more painful this journey becomes. But I still need to find out more about Mariah. I know she was mixed race 
and probably the link between the black and the white side of my family. She may be the key to uncovering my family's roots. How can you help me find the slave woman, Mariah? You know, we need to go to Alexander's father, Samuel. And I think Samuel may be the clue that we need to be able to find Mariah. There's some stuff in here on Samuel Perrier. Let's try this one. Book 22. Hold on a second. I don't know if you know much about my history, but I played football for 15 years in the National Football League. I've been wearing jersey number 22 since college. Wow. And for the information that we're looking for to be locked in book 22, it's kind of, kind of odd. <laughs> Maybe it's your destiny. Maybe it is my destiny. And I've always believed I was a child of destiny, but this is, ooh. It's making me a little nervous. <laughs> it's making me a little nervous. Now, this was the 22nd Book of Deeds registered in Mecklenburg County. This is a deed transferring property. Samuel Pereer of the County of Mecklenburg in the state of Virginia. Confirm and two. Alexander. The following property, a Negro girl named Mariah. Wow. And horse, saddle, saddle, bridle for forever. Mariah. Here I see Mr. Samuel Pereer gives to Alexander a young slave girl by the name of Mariah. Back in the 1870 census, she was 55, I believe. And so we think she was born in 1815. So here, this is dated 1826. Correct. She's 11 years old. Wow. So they're taking care of this girl from family member to family member. Correct. Here, she's with Samuel. Samuel and probably Sam had her bread. And then when she got old enough, he gave her to his son. You said Samuel probably had her bread. Probably. Meaning he was the father of her? Don't know that. They raised and bred horses and raised and bred slaves. In terms of putting the times in perspective, I've got a, a booklet here that can actually trace the horses of Mecklenburg County all the way back to England. In other words, the horses were more important than any slaves that they ever had. Exactly. Slaves were bred just like livestock. I understand that. I treated my people like animals, but worse than animals. Animals were treated better. better. Animals were recorded. Mariah was passed down with a horse bridle and a saddle. She was such a young woman, 11 years old. I have a 13-year-old daughter right now, and I have a 10-year-old daughter right now. And I couldn't imagine them being passed down uh, through slavery that way. If people can trace horses' bloodlines back to Europe, why can't I trace mine back to Africa? So far, Emmett Smith has gone back almost 200 years through some of the darkest times in American history. But he's still trying to piece together the life of his ancestor, Mariah. He's trying to find the link to his family's white ancestry. Stephen Diley, one of the top experts in American slavery, is going to help Emmett better understand the life of Mariah and attempt to answer the question of why the Purriers kept the family together. We can suspect that she was probably born here in Mecklenburg County around 1815. Uh, she was born on a farm. It's almost certain that her mother was a slave owned by Samuel. I've always wondered how she became a mulatto. And right now, it appears that Samuel may have been Mariah's father. Do you think my hunch is correct that Samuel is the father? of Mariah. I would put money on the fact that, that Samuel was Mariah's father. And why? Because when most slave owners impregnated their slave women, they usually sold the child and the child's mother away because the slave owner's wife did not like to have these constant reminders of their husband's infidelities shoved in their face. This is somewhat the case with Mariah. Once she gets old enough to be on her own, 
Samuel gets her out of the house and gives Mariah to Alexander. The reason I think while Alexander was engaged in this horrible, horrible traffic and why he didn't sell Mariah is because he recognized Mariah as, as his sister, as his family. But I think it's very, very likely that Mariah's birth was, right. her birth was not willing. Samuel was cold and heartless. That's right. But you also have to realize that Samuel is your great, 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 great grandfather. I know. I know. I know. I'm glad my heart is not like his. <laughs> that much I do know. Yeah, I'm glad too. Oh my gosh. And I'm glad he doesn't know me. I think one of the things that's so inspirational about Mariah is that she had all of her children with her after emancipation. She had to have seen thousands and thousands of kids just like her being torn from their parents and then, you know, be sent to somebody who could do with them whatever they wanted. And so she was lucky, but I also think that the reason Mariah survived was because her second child that was born was a girl. And Mariah, I think, very astutely named this girl Mary. So she named her first daughter after yeah. Alexander's wife right. to constantly remind them that she was family. I mean, her whole life, she was walking a tightrope. Right. You know, she had one foot in black slavery, the other foot in this white family and she never fell off. The skillfulness of a slave woman, to have that wittedness to balance both sides was extremely uh, courageous of her. I mean, she was lucky, but she also made her own luck. Yeah, she made her own luck. She yeah, created her own right. luck. In a time period when half of all black families were torn apart, she somehow survived and kept her kids. I mean, it's just really one of the most incredible stories I've ever come across. As far as Mariah goes and tracing beyond her, I think that she will probably be the end of the line. And I really don't think you'll be able to go past that. And the reason is because there are no more records. I've traced my family back six generations and almost 200 years. From my grandmother Irma Lee to the Watsons in Burnt Corn, Alabama, and to the amazing Mariah and my slave owning ancestors in Mecklenburg, Virginia. I feel disappointed that I've not been able to go any farther. And it appears that I've hit a brick wall. But I'm also excited because I discovered Mariah. And within Mariah, I see a woman of strength, great strength. Finding Mariah is part closure. Now I want to see what's behind Mariah. I'm just looking for information so I can connect with my roots. I have my DNA results coming this morning. Maybe I can get some breakthrough. Good morning. Pleasure meeting you, Megan. I understand you have some DNA that possibly could help me break through this wall and go further. Well, I think we could help a little bit with that wall, yeah. OK. Yeah. What if I were to tell you that you're roughly 7% Native yeah. American? Wow. <laughs> yeah. That's nice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, you also have roughly 12% European. 12% European. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So does that confirm up uh, the Pereers? Well, it suggests that you probably have several European ancestors several. in your family tree. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> oh my gosh. OK, what this leaves us with is that you're 81% African. 81% African? Yeah, 81% which is actually one of the highest I've ever seen. Really? Yeah. And I've never seen any African-American results be 100% African. Right. Yeah. So you are quintessentially African. <laughs> <laughs> well, that confirms that, yeah, that's good news. That's good news. See, you do have a lot of African ancestors. Now, in terms of telling where they came from, your family, both your paternal and maternal branches, seem to be from this neck of the woods. So we're talking, you know, Benin, the Slave Coast area. Oh, we got to go to Africa. We have to go. We got to go to Africa.
Emmett Smith has been on an incredible journey into his family history. It's taken him back 200 years and back to the motherland of Africa. The results of his DNA are in and indicate that he's 81% African from the region of Benin. This area of Benin is called a slave coast, which was the second biggest exporter of slaves during the slave trading period. It's kind of like being in the United States when you think about the things that happened over there and trafficking of slaves from Virginia down to Alabama. It's kind of the same thing, it's just here in Africa. I know now that some of my ancestors came from this coastline and it's a beautiful place, but yet a lot of cruelty happened here. I've come to the Weta Museum of History, which is a converted slave fort, to find out more about my African heritage. How you doing? You're welcome. Emma Smith. I'm Falola. Falola. I'm trying to find some information about the African slave trading that was going on right here in Weta. He demanded quelle est cette place. Les esclaves restaient sur cette cour. Alors la seule là qui mourait encore sur la route, on le jetait dans cette fosse. The slaves they reside here just to check if they are resistant. Then they are brought to the ship for the for the, voyage. for the voyage. So what you're telling me is this courtyard right here served as a mechanism for the slaves to be weeded out from the strong and the weak. And the strong were the ones who were taken to the to the ships for the voyage to America or wherever else they needed to go. Yeah. Obviously. Without them surviving, I wouldn't be here today. We can't say for sure, but we may have come back to the origin of where Mariah's parents, grandparents, and great-grandparents could have been from. And it is painful to be right here and to stand and know what transpired from this spot. I've been invited to a remote village, which I've been told will give me a window into the lives of my ancestors. OK, Mede, a lot of kids around. Give me the story of this school. The children here have been collected from everywhere in the country to be educated here. Where are these children's parents? Many of them have no parents here. They have been collected to withdraw them from uh, what we call here uh, children trafficking. Uh, children trafficking? Yeah. There's still slavery and trafficking going on right here in Africa. Yeah, yeah. And now they're trafficking young children, boys and girls of yes. all ages. Yeah, that's it. When the traffickers come in the village, the poor people sell their children. That's unfortunate. When these kids are sold off mm. from their parents mm. into slavery, what type of jobs do these young people do? The boys uh, mostly work uh, on uh, the granite mines. Granite and, mines? Yeah. And the girls mostly work in the market to sell things for the traffickers. Wow. Mm. Yeah, I understand it. I feel it. My ancestors were trafficked into slavery in the United States a long time ago, over 200 years ago. But to know that it's still happening in modern time is tragic. Any one of these kids could be Mariah or the next Mariah. When you have to sell your kids into slavery so you can survive, it's heartbreaking. Back in America, people don't understand how well we have it until you come down here and see this. And this is their normal way of life. And most of them probably don't know any different. I came from America to see where my ancestors were from. Now that I know more about the motherland and the history of this country, I wish them all well and much success in the future. Was that complete? Oui. 
I couldn't come to the motherland without sharing my experiences with my wife, Pat. So she's come to join me in Weta. It's been a great experience. Traveling to burnt corn, even up in Mecklenburg, Virginia, and in Boynton County, and even right here in Africa. I have found what I was looking for. And, and, you all right, baby? <laughs> I have found what I was looking for. That's why God has a way of showing, you that, know. You know, and I look at it that way. I look at it as God has this way of saying, <laughs> journey was worth it. And I can hear my ancestors. I can feel it. I can hear it. That they were crying out, thank you. Thank you. My soul is not lost. My great, 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 great grandson, Emma Jane Smith III, has found me. And the prodigal son has come back home. They would be proud. <laughs> I feel like this story, my personal story, will shed light on a whole lot of issues. In Alabama, the crying of the slaves saying, I am now found. I think their souls can move on to heaven. This has been such a powerful journey for me. I feel like my eyes have been opened even wider than they were before. I just feel good. I feel good, I feel cleansed. And so history is not his story anymore. His story is really my story right now.